All right. Yeah, this is a request from Xenophobic, The Life of Norm MacDonald documentary. Um, yeah, he said you'll be interested in this, and I am. So, yeah, let's go. There'll be a lot of party days later. <laughs> but right now, this is, the, I'm dead. Like, that guy clearly, in the best way, didn't give a fuck. So he would do jokes that he knew we're going to get nothing. When he smiled, I could picture him as a as a child. You get more than a joke and a laugh. You get you get that tone. You get that attitude. There is that uh, invisible connection. Deep down, he was actually very very shy. Why can't unfunny people die? Norm Macdonald was an acquired taste, never afraid to take risks and push the boundaries of the audience expectations. His long rambling jokes and deadpan delivery left some bemused, yet his sharp wit and unexpected punchlines, accompanied by a mischievous smile, would result in him becoming one of the most beloved comedians of the last 30 years. He passed away of leukemia on September the 14th, 2021, at the age of 61. His death would come as a shock to many as he hid his 10 years struggle with cancer from the public preferring to face his illness alone, not wanting to become a figure of pity to his peers and audience. Death had been a subject which Norm had contemplated deeply throughout his life, possibly fueled by the stark bleakness of the surroundings in which he grew up in. So when you grew up, what did your folks do? Uh, well, my dad, we were, we were like real poor and stuff, uh, but later my dad became like a teacher, so he had a little bit of money. But yeah. We lived like on a rural... Like, With animals? Farm. It was a dead farm. Yeah, it was my father's father's farm, but that by this point it had become dead. But it was interesting because everyone was old where I lived, except me and my brothers. So I I was with old men all the time. Yeah, but I liked them a lot. <laughs> yeah, I really liked them. Do you still like old people? Love them. I love super old people because uh, it's uh, like it, it it helps you with perspective. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Norm was born on October 17, 1959 in Quebec City, on the cusp of the intense cultural change in French Canada. A primary change was an effort by provincial government to take more control over the fields of healthcare and education, which had previously been in the hands of the Roman Catholic Church. Although he grew up in this largely French-speaking area, Norm's father would forbid the family from learning French, possibly a resistance Good to the man. newly titled Québécois of French Canadians trying to create a separate identity from both the rest of Canada and France and establish themselves as a reformed province. Norm's father, Percy Lloyd MacDonald, was born in 1916, so he had first-hand Jesus, experience of the Great right. Depression, and though he never spoke much about it, his values and beliefs were informed by that difficult period. He was already in his 50s when Norm was born, so Norm and his two brothers grew up and around elder relatives and were surrounded by the verbiage, values and traditions. It was an unusual upbringing which set Norm apart from his contemporaries, but one which helped shape the person he eventually became. Norm's schooling was held on the CFB Val Cartier military base, just north of Quebec City. When I was a kid, I went to school, right. and there was this retard in my class. I guess back then they didn't, like, take the retards out. Right. So he was, like, really big. He was bigger well, than maybe, everyone else. Norm, you were just... He was, like, twice as big as everybody. His name was Vipon. <laughs> yeah. And my dad was my teacher, you know? Right. And my dad was, like, a tough guy. Your dad was your teacher? Yeah. And, wow. and you went to public school? Yeah. And Where they put you, you in a class school? with your... Because they never do that. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, they what did. What was it, like a one-room schoolhouse? No, it was pretty small, but... Oh, no, hey, when do you so mess? My up? dad was tough. He was yeah, a right. tough guy. And so so uh, and my dad said, uh, hey, you got to be friends with a damn retard Vipond. Right. So he made me be his friend for a whole year. <laughs> yeah. And I remember, like, he'd come over, you know, and one time, like, we played Scrabble. Oh, man. And, and like, he'd just put any letters, and my dad goes, whatever the hell he puts. <laughs> you got you to accept it. Both his parents were English teachers at the school and would teach Norm's classes periodically. Norm was a highly promising student with a natural inclination for mathematics. Impressively doing calculus at nine years old, which resulted in him being moved up a grade multiple times. But Norm had a disdain for the rigid rules and boundaries that sought to control both his behaviour and his thoughts. For this reason, he would become more disruptive during his later school years. Norm was a complicated child, and there was something a little off-kilter with him when he spoke about his childhood. He never shared much in interviews, but one could always detect a hint of a troubled past, a sense of something unspoken. There seemed to be a period of his life, an experience which he never quite recovered. Well, because I never, like, spoke or anything. You shy? Yeah, yeah, but, like, 
you know how people say they were shy when they were children? I was like, it was like a pathology or something. Like I couldn't, like I, if I went to a store, I had to walk around the the store for like 10 times before I could talk to the storekeeper. Based on a true story is the novel Norm wrote that presents a fictionalised account of his life. In chapter 4, Norm writes about being sexually abused at six years old in a tool shed by a farmhand called Old Jack. When I found him, he was sitting under the blighted maple tree. You sad, Old Jack? You thinking about the war, I asked? Old Jack just sat still for the longest time, like I wasn't even there. It was like he couldn't hear or see me, like he was hearing and seeing different things. So I just stood there. And after a good long time, Old Jack looked up and seemed surprised that I was in front of him. Well, hello, Sprite, he said. What's the matter? You look kind of down. Well, I just didn't like Angus McGregor's story, that's all. Say, Sprite, I know what'll lift your spirits. Well, I know the very thing. How'd you like to see a trained squirrel? I was very excited. But you said you could never show him to me, old Jack. I haven't got the money to get you a true birthday present, Sprite. This'll have to do. So we walked down the lane together toward the North Forty. The beneficent moon hung low and shone bright, leading us to the shed. When we arrived there, I was so excited I couldn't wait. I pushed the door open and rushed inside, looking for that squirrel, but I couldn't find him. I realized my mistake that he'd only come out for old Jack. So I glanced back at the open door where old Jack stood, but his back was to me now, and I was blocking out the light of the moon. I suddenly remembered that I'd read somewhere how the light of the moon was just an illusion, and the moon was only a cold, cold stone. I watched old Jack look from side to side before he turned his gaze on me, and his eyes flashed black like the wing of a crow. He closed the door, and the inside of the shed went black. Then I heard the bolts. I forget what happened next. Norm was later asked about this in an interview in 2016. Well, let's, we wanted to talk about, if we may, probably the darkest moment of the book, is you, you imply pretty strongly that you were sexually abused as a young man at the hand of a seemingly kindly family friend. Uh, well, I just write what I remember happening, yeah. Did that give you any pause, first of all, to... to well, I remember to nothing. I don't remember being... Uh... Someone pointed it out to me later that it, there seemed to be a, a passage where people would just naturally infer that something bad happened, but nothing bad happened that I know of. Really? Because mm. it's a frightening moment in the book, and there's a chapter where you do say, I don't remember anything that happened for the next several yeah, years. Yeah, I, I, I had a lapse of memory for a few years. Do you have any interest in figuring out what did happen? Um, no, I would. If, if if something terrible happened, why would you want to remember something awful? Did like you, it's tell me? Not, you never have a recovered memory that's good. You never go. I used to like blueberry pie. You know what I mean? It's always something horrifically violent or sexual. So I don't need that. I have enough trouble in life. Before Norman and his family left their farm and moved to Ottawa, on that's crazy. I never knew that about Norm. Yeah, okay, I'll let you out in a minute. Two seconds. Yeah, that's crazy. Because they talk about that, in it, where people just completely block things. Literally, like, they have no memory of the thing they're talking about because it's... Their brain is basically like a defense mechanism. Just basically erases people's brains or makes them remember something different. Like, that's very common in child abuse cases. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's tragic. I did not know that about Norm. Crazy. It's amazing that that never, yeah, you'd think you'd want to know. And quite a, a lot of people have that type of same thing where they have no memory, but they remember something but have no, yeah. But anyway, I just need to sort the dog out two seconds. All right. Yeah, let's carry on. Yeah, that was some heavy shit. This is a good documentary because, yeah, that's some inf new info for me on Norm. 
Ontario, Norm attended Gloucester High School. Out of respect for his parents, who instilled the importance of education in him, in, Norm was dutiful to his studies. His prowess was still particularly evident in mathematics, but the confines of academia was wearing for Norm. Despite cautious warnings of his parents, he had no desire to follow in their footsteps, to slog away a 9-to-5 job with little hope of achieving anything but a stable income. Norm wanted to take his life in a different direction. He continued to go through the motions while deciding what to do with his life. School was too easy for Norm and he would graduate at age 14, despite his later claims that he dropped out. At 16, Norm then proceeded to Carleton University in Ottawa to study mathematics and philosophy, but he would soon drop out. Afterwards, briefly enrolling in Algonquin College's programme for journalism and broadcasting television, following in his elder brother's Neil Macdonald's footsteps. Neil continues to have a successful career today for the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. Norm would then move to Vancouver on his own and proceeded to work odd jobs of manual labour to make money while deciding what to do with his life. Yeah. And what did you work at here? Uh, just like m manual labour. I was too young to... I had to get like... I was like an undocumented worker, kind of, I guess, looking back. And then we'd stand on the corner and trucks would get, no in, and get in them and stuff like that. What? But, yeah. How old are you? <laughs> well, no, it wasn't. Well, no, it wasn't like the depression. It was like <laughs> <laughs> grapes around. Yeah, like if you're standing at the for, for temporary labor, like you stand on the corner and then trucks go by, and then you all run up to the truck and try to get in. And then they have these other temporary manpower places where they really jip you, where they take almost all the money and they give you like minimum wage back then was three fifteen an hour or something like that. But then the company that the middleman for the company would make eight whatever, and then you'd go and then you'd like the like the worst was that I were I, I was in a garbage truck once. <laughs> it seemed fun at the time. It seemed like hey, that's fun, like riding on the back of a garbage truck, because you know you're riding, you're standing up. It looked fun when I was a kid. Fresh air, yeah. Yeah, but but first of all, the guy goes way faster than you think. The driver, <laughs> like you never have time. And then people put everything in their garbage. Like it'd be, <laughs> you'd pick up the garbage can, be filled with sod, it'd weigh like two hundred pounds, mm -hmm. and then the next place would be like a couch that's broken in half. <laughs> and then you're exhausted. And then the funniest was you go, <laughs> they all all the garbage men went to the same place for lunch, <laughs> so they completely ruined this fucking guy's business. <laughs> <laughs> just stinking there. Yeah, his restaurant just stuck of garbage, and uh, and so he had no other clientele after a while. And then, so you're exhausted and everything. And then, at the end of the day, like you're so tired, and then that you drive to the dump, which is the worst place. It's just like like hell itself. You know, <laughs> there's little fires all over. There's rats running around everywhere. <laughs> it's just, and then you drive home, and then I had to get on a bus, and, and you smell like garbage. In his quiet moments during these long working hours, Norm had decided to pursue his love of stand-up comedy. Being incredibly shy and introverted, Norm would create an on-stage persona of sorts in order to feel more comfortable performing. A comedian Norm grew up admiring was Bob Hope. Not for the quality of his comedy, but for the on-air persona Bob had created for himself. During his career, when appearing on talk shows, before any interview, Bob Hope would spend time preparing in advance, making sure he knew every question the interviewer would be asking beforehand, ensuring that he had a supply of quips and one-liners at the ready to deflect any questions that were being thrown his way, particularly those he deemed to be too personal or intrusive. In doing so, he always cleverly managed to keep everyone laughing, but also maintained an air of mystery never once letting his showbiz mask slip in front of the cameras. This resonated with Norm and was something he would employ throughout his career. Bob Hope was a fantastic comic because he was never ever once serious and he never got a sense of... There's two kinds of guys. There's guys like Pryor who are like brilliant because they're so vulnerable and you know who they are. And then there's guys like Bob Hope who are brilliant because they're like invisible. To me, Bob Hope, in a way, is a little bit on a higher level because he presents a sort of a existential view of life where everything is, is reduced to the, the, the breeziest jokes possible. It doesn't even seem like he's a person. It seems like he's a cartoon. 
And I think if you can rise to the level of cartoon, then... And Bob Hope, the fact that you can't even quote a Bob Hope joke, and yet he was maybe the most successful stand-up comic in the, ever, is a testament to his unbelievable skills as a stand-up comic, because he didn't need jokes. <laughs> this guy didn't have good jokes. They, people would write them for him, and they and, the, and they all sucked. And he, I remember him going on the Tonight Show. Every joke sucked. And then afterwards, he'd be smiling and stuff. During 1985, Norm would start his stand-up career, regularly performing in comedy clubs around Ottawa. Yuck Yucks was the comedy club where Norm started making his name. Uh, I think uh, one of the hottest guys around, as they all are tonight, but this is definitely one of the hottest guys. A big hand, please, for Mr. Norm MacDonald. Nice of you yelling my name. No problem, Norm. Okay, excellent. So, you ever get a lottery ticket, like buy a lottery ticket? Huh? Yeah. <laughs> you ever get one somebody give you one as a present, like for Christmas or something like that? That's always a weird gift there, huh? I think that's the weirdest gift. Say, here you go. Nothing. <laughs> But his confidence was shaky in the beginning. On one occasion, Norm fled the stage, convinced that he had flopped spectacularly, believing that he could never do comedy again. Howard Wagman, the manager of Yuck Yucks, had been highly impressed with Norm's performance and chased him down and invited him back to do more gigs. This spurred Norm on to continue honing his craft. With his confidence growing, Norm was attracting attention on the comedy circuit. Many were surprised at how quickly he was progressing at stand-up comedy. It was also at Yuck Yucks where Norm met his future wife-to-be, Connie Valencourt, who was waiting tables. After a short courtship, the pair would marry. Within just six months in 1986, he was heralded by the Montreal Gazette as one of the country's hottest comics. After his performance at the Just for Laughs Comedy Festival in Montreal, but in the same year came Norm's first bout with cancer, which threatened to derail his promising start in the industry. This resulted in Norm taking a year off for treatment on his stomach cancer diagnosis. In a 1986 interview for the Montreal Gazette, Norm shared with Bill Brownstein how a diagnosis of cancer had given him a new perspective on life. He told the reporter that he had initially attempted to joke about it in his stand-up act, though no one believed him. Subsequently, he quit smoking and his comedy material took on a brighter outlook. After making a full recovery from cancer, Norm was eager to get back out on the road and try his material out on new audiences. So he embarked on a journey, crossing the border from Canada into the United States. Performing wherever he could, the American audiences took to Norm's unique comedy style. The next couple of years saw Norm regularly work in the LA comedy circuit, soon attracting the attention of a few casting directors. His big break came in the form of a spot on the popular variety show Star Search, hosted by Ed McMahon. Ed McMahon was best known as the long-running sidekick to Johnny Carson on The Johnny Carson Show. Remembered fondly as the human laughter track as his laughter had a way of ensuring Carson's jokes didn't fall flat. As Norm warily took to the stage, Ed McMahon watched in rather stern silence from the wings. Norm wasn't expecting a rapturous reception, but his set fell on surprisingly deaf ears, winning just three quarters of a star. He recalled looking across to Ed McMahon at one point and being met with a fierce glare, making it all too clear his performance had not hit the mark as trusty old Ed wouldn't even muster a fake laugh. And she said they have an opening for a comedian tonight. You'd have your own half-hour special and a comprehensive dental plan. It's such a good opportunity, dear. But, Mom, I'm not a comic. I'm a healer. Just this once, dear. Do it for your father's sake. He'd be so proud. Hmm? No, la. Then Nipsey says to me, I got news for you. That is not a bratwurst. <laughs> All right, I'll do the damn show. But I won't be happy. I'll be miserable. Fair enough. We better leave now. You're on stage in 15 minutes. Oh. As Norm's comedy career began to gather momentum, he received the news of his father's passing. His father had been a great influence on Norm's life, and although he wasn't the most loving dad, he offered wisdom and lessons to Norm, rooted in a different, more traditional era. 
Despite the humiliating performance on Star Search, Norm caught attention of casting agents of The David Letterman Show. And now, making his network television debut, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome uh, Norm MacDonald. Norm, are you... Uh, thanks, good to be here. Uh, uh, I've been traveling around a lot, watching a lot of the TV, you know, and uh, you see these new sports on the TV where they'll try to combine two sports together and make up a new sport. You know, like a guy will run a 100-yard dash and then fish. <laughs> so I love the TV. You know, I saw a cat food commercial, and I said at the end of it, I said, all natural food for your cat, all natural food. But cat food is made out of horse meat. Yeah, that's the way it works in nature. The, the cat right above the horse in the food chain. <laughs> Norm's performance on the show was a resounding success. And from that moment in 1990, he became a regular and a much-loved fixture on the David Letterman show. I'm sit Dave, I'm sitting here beside you. I'm right beside you. I'm over here in the chair here. <laughs> there he is, Norm MacDonald. He was so well received that he was then invited onto the Conan O'Brien show, where his unique brand of humor was once again embraced by the audience and Conan and himself. Do you have a scene where you and, and you, you and him embrace? Yeah, lots of making out. Oh, for God's sake. <laughs> Nothing but making out. All right. It's like nine and a half weeks, but carrot top. <laughs> we were doing. Wow! <laughs> I gotta check out that movie. Is it called Nine and a Half Seconds? <laughs> Like he's premature ejaculated. <laughs> you know, you know what happened. This is what happened. You know what happened. He said nine and a half seconds, and I'm looking at him because I know there's more. And I wait and wait, and I see the glimmer in the eye, and then bang! I thought you were going to, but no. But uh, what's the movie going to be called? No, no. Get on your bed. Called. Yeah, what's that? Right there. If it's got Carrot Top in it, you know what a good name for it would be? What's that, Norm? Box Office Poison. <laughs> I'm in it, too. She's in it. What about my career? Courtney Thorne Smith, the girl sitting to your left, is in the movie. I'm going to go see it for Courtney. <laughs> Else away no, I love this girl. Win? I would see any movie with this girl in. She's a beautiful lady and, <laughs> and a talented, nice talk show guest. <laughs> As evidenced by her appearance on our rival show. <laughs> All right, well, there's this two hour season finale of Melrose Place. There's this movie coming out. Yes. Title undetermined at this point. Chairman of the board. Oh. All right. Do something with that, you freak. <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet the board is spelled B O R E D. <laughs> Norm would become a popular guest for television and radio as he was able to converse on any subject, no matter how out of depth he might be, making funny observations while being charming and engaging. I know how this stuff happens, man. Because a buddy of mine worked on Saturday Night Live and he said he was a fag once as a joke. <laughs> And then he said, everybody comes up to him and say, are you a fag? <laughs> gay, mom, gay man, I mean. <laughs> show about smoking. They thought you meant the British word for cigarette. All right. Uh... Exactly. <laughs> Can I bum a fag? That's what they say in England. <laughs> Following his rounds on TV, Norm was spotted for his quick wit by the producers of The Dennis Miller Show. It wasn't long before he was being noticed by Roseanne Barr, who felt she needed a writer from a completely different background compared to the usual Harvard-educated writers on the staff. In 1992, Norm and Connie had their first and only son together, Dylan. It was always a source of great pride to Norm that he was a father, and he did his utmost to provide for his son. He ensured Dylan had the best education, claiming he wanted him to have the experiences and opportunities that he himself had never had. After a short period writing for Roseanne, Norm's big break came in 1993 when he joined NBC's Saturday Night Live. After being initially hired as a writer, Norm eventually became a cast member and would spend a total of five seasons on the show. Hey, hey, uh, check out the podium. Look at this. Mr. Reynolds has apparently changed his name to Turd Ferguson. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Turd Ferguson. It's a funny name. 
<laughs> yeah! What happened? What happened? Did the bear get him? I'm not wearing my glasses. Yeah, the polar bear killed Jay. What do you mean you weren't talking to me? You were looking right at me. When you, who are you calling Mr. Dictionary? We're at the, we're at the Red Lobster there, Paul, and I'm enjoying what I always get there. You know what I always get, the, uh, the fisherman's platter. <laughs> but Norm's most notable performance on the show was undoubtedly his tenure as the Weekend Update anchor during the O.J. Simpson murder trial. He would compound O.J.'s guilt every week on this segment. Potential jurors for the O.J. Simpson case were asked to fill out a 75-page jury questionnaire this week. In the entire state of California, only one person got a perfect score. Chow Ming Wu, who after the trial, plans to attend Caltech. By the way, you can now purchase a bronze statue of the juice for only $3,395. And for an even five grand, you can buy one that Al Cowlings has kissed the ass of. You could hear Colin laugh then, I think. O.J. Simpson's new fitness video was released this week, and hitting the shelves next week, Simpson's newest video, Dorf on Stocking. <laughs> The crowd is torn. <laughs> According to retailers, the most popular Halloween mask this year is O.J. Simpson. And the most popular Halloween greeting is, I'll kill you and that guy who's bringing over your glasses, or treat. <laughs> And the Pope came out with a book this week, which contains a series of essays examining faith and morality in today's secular world and the changing role of the Catholic Church as it approaches the 21st century. The book is entitled, God Himself Told Me That O.J. Is Guilty. In other book news, Prince Charles released an autobiography in which he states that he never loved Princess Di and that his father pressured him to marry her. The book is entitled, of course O.J. did it, I mean, come on. In his book, O.J. Simpson says that he would have taken a bullet or stood in front of a train for Nicole. Man, I'm going to tell you, that is some bad luck when the one guy who would have died for you kills you. That's probably... You don't get worse luck than that. And O.J. announced this week that he's coming out with a new book called I Want to Tell You. And if it's successful, O.J. will work on yet another book entitled From Football to Prison, My 25 Years of Showering with Other Men. <laughs> and finally, in honor of the 50th anniversary of their first publication, Random House will be releasing special commemorative issues of many Dr. Seuss classics. The first to hit the bookshelves will be Green Eggs and Ham and O.J. is Guilty. <laughs> Judge Ito was interviewed this week by a local TV station in Los Angeles, asked by the interviewer if it was appropriate for a supposedly impartial judge to be on TV with his case still pending. Ito said, maybe not, but how appropriate is it to kill your ex-wife? <laughs> It was revealed today that O.J. Simpson told police that Nicole Brown Simpson used to beat him up. He also claimed that she and Ron Goldman killed him. <laughs> O.J. Simpson's lawyers have decided to skip hearings on DNA evidence and go right to trial. Asked why they did this, the lawyers replied, we want to get O.J. acquitted as speedily as possible so he can get back to doing what he does best, killing people. Well, let's get to O.J. O.J. Simpson's lawyers say they don't want the families of Nicole Brown and Ronald Goldman in the courtroom during the trial. They're afraid the presence of the family members will just remind O.J. of how much more killing he still has to do. <laughs> well, O.J. Simpson's lawyers stopped feuding this week, finally. The dream team F. Lee Bailey and Robert Shapiro were able to put aside their differences and express their admiration for each other 
after O.J. threatened to cut their heads off. <laughs> According to the National Transportation Safety Board, sleepy truckers are responsible for 1,000 deaths a year. In second place, O.J. Simpson at two deaths a year. <laughs> it was revealed this week that defense lawyer Johnny Cochran once abused his first wife. In his defense, Cochran said, hey, at least I didn't kill her like some people I know. <laughs> Tomorrow, Judge Lancito will take O.J. and the jury on a tour of the now famous crime scene. For the jury, it will be their first look at the actual location. Of course, for O.J., it will be just a case of, been there, done that. <laughs> Judge Lancito was happy with the jurors' field trip to the crime scene last week. It went off without a hitch, said Ito. Not one murder. <laughs> O.J.'s pal Al Cowlings now has a 1-900 number. For $2.99 a minute, Cowlings will tell callers that O.J. is innocent. And for $3.99 a minute, he'll try to do it without laughing. <laughs> and this week, Simpson defense lawyers questioned witnesses about a half-melted container of ice cream found at the murder site. The Simpson defense has seized upon the ice cream for two reasons. One, it may help fix the time of the murders, and two, it was the only thing in the murder scene without any of O.J.'s blood on it. <laughs> to illustrate the point that their client is running out of money to defend himself, O.J. Simpson's lawyer said this week that if he had to do it over again, after killing his victims, O.J. would now rob them as well. <laughs> That one you find troubling? We went, what? Hey, I'll stop there and come back. I'll cut these all together anyway, so it'll all be as one. But yeah, he is, some of these, I've seen a lot of the OJ jokes, and I haven't seen some of these. Um, he was hitting him hard. Yeah, crazy. <laughs> but yeah, like I say, we'll come back with the rest. Sweet. Yeah, let's carry on. Let's go. Victims, OJ would now rob them as well. <laughs> that one you find troubling? We went, was OJ Simpson high on speed the night of the murders? Absolutely not, said defense attorney Johnny Cochran today. And a simple test of any of OJ's blood found at the crime scene will prove it. And O.J. pal Al Cowling said this week that in looking for the truth in the O.J. Simpson case, he sometimes talks to a picture of Nicole Brown Simpson, something that in the past would have gotten him killed by O.J. <laughs> F. Lee Bailey said this week that if the defense only knew what Ron Goldman's last words were, they might be able to find the real killer. You know, if you ask me, Goldman's last words were probably, uh, hey, you're O.J. Simpson. <laughs> Oh, no, O.J. has struck again. How about that? <laughs> Not a good thing. And in court this week, Cato Kalin testified that O.J. Simpson did not appear angry before or after the period of his wife's murder. But Kalin admitted he could have been a touch edgy while he was actually murdering her. <laughs> Might have been a... Hertz rental car company announced this week that it will buy 520,000 vehicles, increasing its worldwide fleet 24%. In addition, they will try to find a new spokesman who won't kill his ex-wife. It was also during this period Norm suffered greatly from panic attacks, claiming he once had a panic attack while filming his weekend update segment. Norm was surprised when he was offered the Sedgman. job of hosting the White House Correspondents' Dinner. He never imagined himself to be the type of person the White House would consider for this position, 
as Normador has considered himself to be somewhat avant-garde and was certain that they would be seeking a more traditional type of host. Secretary of State Madeleine Albright, you know, media mogul Rupert Murdoch, you know, uh, broadcast legend Larry King, you know, uh, pornographer Larry Flint, you know, Dick Morris, the list is starting to drop off a little, folks, but still, you get the idea, it's daunting. And of course, it was very inspiring to see President Clinton up here on crutches making a speech. I mean, I thought that was just uh, amazing, you know. Uh, I mean, it's been difficult for the president. You know, he can't jog now, and uh, he needs help getting around. And he still, you know, he still uh, occasionally suffers great pain, you know. Uh, on the upside, you got your medical marijuana, so that's, uh, you know. You must inhale, sir. It's the only way you're going to get better. It's... <laughs> Back at like SNL, it. the higher-ups had advised Norm to stop with the OJ material, but despite the warnings, Norm continued with his jokes, not realising the cost it would eventually incur. His actions displeased Don O'Meyer, NBC producer and friend of OJ Simpson, leading to Norm being dismissed from the show. You don't mind if I ask you a question? What's that? I hear today, I hear this story, and as it's like this press release that you get... It shows you really what a piece of shit world Hollywood really is, <laughs> despite the kind of nice thing they put onto the public. You would think that once you your friend has murdered his wife or girlfriend and her lover, that you would maybe not be loyal to that person. Fired? Is that yeah. true? No, you didn't get fired. Yeah, they fired. No, me. they didn't fire you. No, I'm serious. I, I'm ta I talked to a guy that said I'm fired. <laughs> fired from your television job? From on the weekend. You know, I do the news. Segment, yeah, the weekend update. Yeah, and I do the jokes. I do, uh, you Sometimes, know. many times, the, the best part of the show. Yeah. <laughs> but. Uh, it's all a matter of opinion. That's your opinion. That's my opinion, yeah. But then the guys that can fire me, that's not their opinion. Now, why would they fire you? Well, uh... Who fired you, first of all? Let's get some names here. Let's get this <laughs> on the record. Well, I don't know the guys, like, because the guys I work with, uh, like, Lauren Michaels and stuff. Did Lauren Michaels fire you? No, he did. Uh -huh. He didn't fire me. Right. He, he likes me and stuff. Well, he, it's his show, isn't it? I, I thought it was his show, yeah. But, uh, well, then how can a guy come in from the outside and fire you? Somebody well, see, from ABC fired you? No, no. They're NBC. What happens is... You work on the show, and then there's these guys that hang out, like, in the halls. <laughs> yeah, we got them here. We, yeah. got the, we got them here. And they're called executives. <laughs> they're NBC executives, right? Yeah. And then I'd see them. I didn't know who the hell they were, what they did, you know? <laughs> now I know what they do. They fire me from Weekend Update. But uh, they, uh, they, they said that this guy, Don Olmeyer, who turns out to be the president. Yeah, now I know Don Olmeyer, and yeah. just between you and me, he's an idiot. Oh. <laughs> Uh, I was hanging out and stuff, and then the guys... Reminds me of something Chris Rock says, where he says, uh, you can make a million black people laugh, but one white man, you make one white man laugh, he'll make you rich. And it will also make you poor, I guess. You make the wrong white man um, laugh, uh, not laugh, and you're gone. Hey, man, you got to call this dude Don Olmeyer, who's the president of uh, the network. Don Olmeyer is the president of NBC. Right. And they're telling you, you've got to call Don Olmeyer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he tried to get in touch with you, and they said, please call Don Olmeyer. Who he, tells you to call Don Olmeyer? He didn't try to get in touch no, with no. me. He, 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 he said to Lauren, I want this guy off up there. Hold on two seconds. Just got to sort her out quick. How much further I'm going to get, because she wants to go out. So I don't know how long she's going to get before she starts annoy annoying me, but we should get some done at least. But anyway, it doesn't matter. But yeah, let's carry on. You know. He said, what? Don Olmeyer wants you off update. He told Lauren that. Lauren wants you on, right. but Don Olmeyer wants you off. Right. I don't buy that for a minute. Well, what do you Lauren do? wants you off of it. Right. And yeah. he's afraid to tell you to your face because he has so a relationship with you. So he has Don Olmeyer do it. So he has Don Olmeyer do it. Because what ahead. he got to do with Saturday Night Live? Lauren's the guy in charge of Saturday Night Live. Why do you have to call Don Olmeyer? Well, he's like apparently the. Pre I don't even know who the guy well, is. Yeah. He's the president of the of whole something. network. Yeah, but when any other instructions about <laughs> what you're doing happened, where did they come from? In my. Uh, In your tenure there, who talked to you about what was going on? Answer the question. 
It was Lauren. Right. Fine. So why now are you talking to Don Omar? Because Lauren doesn't have the balls to tell you he wants you off Weekend Update. Wait a minute. Lauren doesn't want me on Weekend Update? Uh, right. Weekend That's update? it. I'm being serious with you now. Of course. Well, that's horrible. <laughs> Norm's personal life appeared to be somewhat tumultuous business. over this period, and it and seemed he was friends. looking for solace in all the wrong places. Rumour had it that he had carried on a brief affair with model Elle McPherson amid the chaos of his divorce proceedings. Norm had also taken up gambling in a big way, with any money that he made being lost nearly immediately. Norm, that girl, she's hot. Gambling is a... Uh, I don't know, you know. I kind of... Uh, like, I went broke like a few times when I actually had lots of money. Gambling. Three times. Gambling. With gambling, yeah. yeah. And I mean broke, dead broke. Like, uh, and... Um, so would you call yourself a degenerate gambler? Well, I don't. Degenerate has a uh, epithetic <laughs> negative kind connotation. Of connotation, yeah. <laughs> but uh, certainly compulsive. <laughs> yeah. And and yeah. but um, I don't know what it was. I, I'm not a psychiatrist, but I do know this. When I would go broke, because they say gamblers want to lose and stuff, yeah. which always seemed odd to me. But I will say the three times that I went broke for a lot of money, I had a very freeing feeling you know i would go to the coffee shop and have a coffee yeah, and, and yeah. have nothing and yeah. I, I, a lot a lot of me is um trying to get the fuck as ascetic as i can in my life oh really so it was a zen fuck thing that. this is like a you would recommend if you wrote a book on zen it would be like go out <laughs> make a bunch of stupid bets <laughs> yeah. lose everything and enjoy <laughs> Yeah, that was, yeah. <laughs> Zen and the art of being a retard. The uh, but I, I, I not because it's, it bring, would bring me peace of mind or anything, but because every every uh, my when I in a, I bought a house for yeah. the first time ever. Yeah, and it was like I was walling myself into a fucking mausoleum or something. I mean, yeah. all of a sudden I'm like, when you had money, fuck yeah. yeah. I'm like, I don't want to be here. Yeah, I don't want to. I don't want a bunch of stuff to have to fucking mostly because I'm lazy. I yeah. guess I don't want to have a fucking footstool because then I have to clean it. I right. Don't know. Right, I, no, like I, I feel the same way. Possible. Well, it's exhausting because there's no end to uh, you, you. You become tethered to it, and you worry about it. Yeah. You got a house. It's like who's going to fix that light? Right. Do I got to call a guy? I Do it. I got to hire a guy to call the guy? And yeah. I'm sure you know, and I know guys because we're not rich, but we know rich guys. Yeah. That have fucking massive houses and and shit, and you go fuck. It seems like a nightmare. Life after SNL started promisingly for Norm, being offered to write and star in his own movie, Dirty Work. I used to work on a farm, which was like, they were rich. It was like 150 grand a year just for their electricity. There's something like 200, she told me there's like 200 and something light bulbs in their house. It's like, yeah. If you make some money, you're better off staying living broke because it really does match like when people think their earning should match their lifestyle yeah i don't know it's crazy based off a short story by roald dahl vengeance is mine norm's friend and fellow comedian bob saget would direct it the film follows longtime friend mitch played by norm and sam played by artie lang who start a revenge for hire business You fellas have a lot of growing up to do, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Ridiculous. The movie received largely negative reviews upon its release and it was financially a disappointment, but has since become a cult classic amongst Norm fans. Despite the failure of his movie, Norm still had plenty of fans within the industry who believed in his talent as a writer and performer. Fortunately, he was offered another project, the chance to write and star in his own sitcom. The Norm Show is about the life of Norm Henderson, played by Norm, a former NHL hockey player who is banned for life from the league because of his gambling and tax evasion. To avoid jail time for these crimes, Norm must perform five years of community service as a full-time social worker. The series was met with mixed reviews. Michelle Greppi of the New York Post was critical of Norm's performance, stating that Norm brings nothing to the would-be comedy except dead weight. Hey, this is a Gambler's Anonymous. It must be down the hall. Look, Mr. Johnson, I can't send any more caregivers to your house, all right? You attacked the last one, and then you filed a lawsuit claiming that he attacked you. It did. <laughs> all right, then. Now, because of your lawsuit, I'm not allowed to send another caregiver to your house, all right? But I'm going to give you a number that you can call. <laughs> Despite the tepid reviews, the show stayed on air for three seasons until it was cancelled in 2001 for low ratings.
but TV executives still hadn't given up on Norm and in 2003 Fox offered him another opportunity to write and star in a sitcom, a minute with Stan Hooper. Stan Hooper, played by Norm, a famous newspaper columnist turned TV commentator, moves his family from their New York... See, I don't know where the reality world was at around this time, but Norm, to me, seems like the perfect person for a reality show. To put him in that kind of setting, right? where just his interaction with the world is what you really want to see, not Norm pretending or acting. Um, yeah, you really want to see just Norm being Norm. So, yeah, I think maybe if this was like a, a, like a few years, Norm's career was a few years on, he would have been maybe one of the biggest realities. But in saying that, you could say the same with Patrice O'Neill and, it's not true with him. Like he can even get a radio show. ...to a small Wisconsin town, where he hopes to better get in touch with middle America in an attempt to make his weekly, long television commentaries more appealing to a larger audience. Norm had stated it was his goal to lull the audience into complacency and become more subversive as time went on, which included a plan for Stan's wife Molly to be murdered by a drifter at the end of the first season, but Fox cancelled the show before any of these plans could be enacted. Comedy Central would then come to Norm with a show reminiscent of his Saturday Night Live weekend update news anchor segment, but instead covering controversial sports-related stories. This week, Phoenix Suns president Rick Welts told the New York Times that he is gay. Rumors have swirled around Welts ever since he debuted his idea for the Suns' new uniforms. No uniforms. <laughs> In a heartwarming gesture, the entire Suns team rallied around their president and blew him. <laughs> this week, Charles Barkley said that every professional athlete has played on a team with a gay guy. Yet, no active player in a major sport has come out of the closet. What the H? Mark it on your calendars, folks. This has been the gayest week in sports ever. Rick Welts, president of the Phoenix Suns, out. Former Villanova player Will Sheridan, out. Professional bowler Scott Norton, out. Imagine how big this news would have been if we knew any of these guys. <laughs> the show was closer to Norm's humour and stand-up, but the viewing figures weren't good enough to warrant another season, and the show was ultimately cancelled. After the failure of multiple of his projects, Norm, true to form, merely shrugged it off with his trademark nonchalance, indifferently brushing it off with the assurance that he didn't care. But on the contrary, Norm most likely cared too much, with his laid-back attitude being a coping mechanism to help him deal with potential failures in life. The late entertainer Dean Martin also employed this attitude throughout his career. If you watch old footage of Dean Martin, he always had a certain air about him, relaxed, composed, and seemingly to simply drift through life with a drink in one hand and a cigarette in the other. It made people think he was perpetually, blissfully intoxicated. I'm you? not starting. How are you? I'm almost through. <laughs> Good to see you. How do all these people get in your room? <laughs> no, but where's the guy you talk to? <laughs> The way it works. John! <laughs> so this is old John, huh? Yeah. You know, not only are you important in show business, but I found out you're important in hotels and everything. Every time I get a room, there's a John. <laughs> but anyone who knew him would know that behind the veneer. Very norm. That's a good comparison, which I'd have never got because I've. I know um, Little Old Wine Drink of Me, I love that song. It's one of my dad's um, favourite songs he used to play uh, on the guitar. Just growing up, you'd always hear my dad sitting on his bed playing that song, um, like himself on guitar. Um, but yeah, it's very similar to Norm in that kind of... almost breaking the fourth wall but not type of thing, like the who who... Who's the guy I talked to? Like that type of, yeah. That's a good comparison to make. It was anything but. His appearance deceptive, his demeanour carefully cultivated. What lay beneath was a man who worked hard and achieved a great deal. 
This attitude, exemplified by Dean Martin and embraced by Norm, was one of the many facets of Norm's personality. While Norm was often seen as laid back, friendly and even vulnerable, there was also a menacing side. I heard you were an ass kicker too. That's pretty nice. You, I, no, go to the I water. heard you were a rough character. And the water... <laughs> I did. <laughs> I heard stories. That's man. different. No, no, the no. Water. I heard stories. I heard stories about Norm where <laughs> a drunk guy comes up to him at the bar and goes, Hey, aren't you Norm? And he's gone. He's just suddenly gone. <laughs> uh, none of this. Norm's back at the bar going, Hey, what happened? What, what happened to that guy? There had always been stories about the scrapes and brawls Norm would get himself into in bars. There seemed to be a deep-seated anger in Norm, possibly a byproduct of childhood trauma or just an inbuilt part of his personality. With his somewhat old-school view of the world, he seemed always out of step with the prevailing liberal consensus on the comedy scene, and he wasn't afraid to stand alone with his beliefs. For instance, on the roast of Bob Saget, Norm wasn't a fan of the crude style of roast comedy, so he decided to do the exact opposite and read jokes from a tame vintage joke book, which his dad had given him before he died. Bob, you have a lot of well-wishers here tonight, and a lot of them would like you to... would like to throw you down one. A well. They want to murder you in a well. <laughs> Seems a little harsh, but... Apparently they want to murder you in a well, it says here on this card. Now, but Bob has a beautiful face, like a flower. Yeah, cauliflower. <laughs> no offense, but your face looks like a cauliflower. As you can see, he has wavy hair. It's waving goodbye on account he's going bald. <laughs> no, I think that, uh, that Bob should join the Ku Klux Klan. And that's not because he's racist. He's not racist. It's just that he'd look a lot better with a hood over his head <laughs> on account of his face. <laughs> no, there are times when Bob has something on his mind when he wears a hat. <laughs> Bob is not very worldly. He thinks the English Channel is a British TV station and not a body of water separating England and France. Do you know that he has never slept with his wife? Isn't that odd? He says that it isn't honorable to sleep with a married woman, even though she's married to him. So, a roast for Bob Saget, right? Who's a friend of mine, yeah. Uh, and I don't, I, I, Nala. I, I'm, I, okay. I guess I don't like roasts, yeah. Uh, but, um, um, I mean, I, I, I shouldn't say that. I guess I admire, I, got, I don't really admire it's a certain style, it's a certain style. <laughs> I've come to accept things, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, <laughs> but Saget said, Can you come and roast me? And Saget's like a really nice guy, and yeah. I said, Fuck, no, I don't know, man. He goes, Come on, can we, I don't know why he kept pushing it, and yeah. Stuff. So I'm like, it was the night before, and, and so this guy, Sandy Gallon, who was the, produces these roasts and stuff. Yeah. Or Joel Gallon. Yeah. I don't know. I, forget, I don't know his name. I only did one, and that was all I could take. <laughs> yeah, it's tough. And so he said, I said, I don't know how to do this stuff. He goes, just be shocking. And so he, uh, luckily when he said shocking, I thought, oh, well, if I do the opposite, you know, it's, uh, I guess I've heard people go, I got it. I go, well, what the fuck is to get? Yeah. In 2013, Norm was diagnosed with multiple... Well, I need to take her out because she started. My sister bought her a ball. It's like a outer casing with a tennis ball inside. That's kept her quiet for a bit, but she's now looking at me and she wants to go out. She's going to start being a pain in my heart. So, yeah, let me just take her for a walk quick and then I'll carry on and finish this off. But, yeah, sweet. All right. Yeah. Let's uh, finish this off. Let's go.
or myeloma, which is a cancer of the plasma cells. He would only disclose his illness to his immediate family. He was prescribed dexamethasone, which caused him to gain weight. For Norm, faced with a cancer diagnosis and searching for comfort and solace, religion became a beacon of hope. He was trying to find some kind of meaning to life and a comfort in the possibility that death may not be the end. You're trying to get uh, some spirituality in your life? I'm trying to, because all I, uh, the only real joy I get, uh, other than I love watching comedy, but uh, anything deeper than that is I read a lot of literature and stuff. I'm not, uh, I'm not educated, like I never had any schooling, uh -huh. and I don't read nonfiction much, but I read lots of literature. Uh -huh. And um, like who? Uh, Tolstoy. Oh and yeah, yeah. Faulkner, but the um, faith keeps coming up, and yeah. I'm like these motherfuckers are smart. Yeah, I mean, you know. Like, I was always like, you know, uh, Pryor's this fucking most deep, profound guy I yeah. ever fucking heard, you know, yeah. from my limited perspective. Now, all of a sudden, I'm reading books. I'm like, holy fuck. This guy knows everything. Like, yeah. I was reading Tolstoy. I was like, fuck, one word, yeah. one sentence, this guy. <laughs> and so, uh, but then I was like, why are all these guys, uh, it all comes down to faith, you know? It seems to every fucking great novel I read, it seems like faith is the, the only... Um, um, salvation. Yeah. So, but I don't know how to get it. Yeah. Away from the public, Norm would remain single for the remainder of his life, his nine year marriage being his only serious relationship. I don't have a busy life. Oh, so then it's good to actually talk to a human. Yeah. I, that, that's the thing I really have to f try to focus on in my life is getting out outside of my apartment talking to human beings well you said you don't go out anywhere no i never uh, and and you don't drink well i don't drink so i don't go to bars like that you know that cuts a lot of social like, that cuts almost all social life out and then uh, i don't like going to restaurants and eating for long periods of time so yeah mostly i'm alone in my apartment can i say a hundred percent understand that 100 percent like i've always been very similar and people think you're weird for it like i'm i suppose i'm yeah i'm not as bad as that because i do know people and i will go out but very rarely because it's like it's the same as having people here i could but then i think of the person being there i just think oh, i can't be bothered <laughs> right yeah so i'll completely 100 percent relate to um, norman i'm the same don't drink so that rules out bars and i don't like going to restaurants um yeah so i completely agree and i don't want to go bowling and i don't want to go to the cinema and i don't want to do you know what i mean i just don't want to if i watch a film it might take me five days to watch a film. Nala, drop that now. Nala. Shit, little shit. Give it here. Bring it here. Come on. Bring it here. Now. Lie down. Lie down. <laughs> she does make me laugh. It's hard to tell her off all the way because she just makes me laugh. Like then, she just did everything I said, but she sat down and then um, sat with her back to me like as if nothing's happening. <clears throat> but yeah, let's go would continue regularly performing stand-up throughout his treatment. It was his first love and the only thing he really enjoyed doing. Whilst at the comedy store in LA, Norm would strike up a friendship with the manager, Adam Eget, with the pair deciding to jump on the podcast bandwagon. 9-11. <laughs> this is what you never hear. Uh, he made love to me in the ass. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a woman. Hey, how about this one? They say pimping ain't easy, Andy. But what they won't tell you is it's much, much more difficult being a prostitute. <laughs> pimping is pretty easy. Barbara Walters is 
planning to announce her retirement. What's next for Babs? Death. <laughs> <laughs> well, how about this? College freshman Scott Damaro, Larry, set a new world record by using his head to bust 142 eggs, and he now officially holds a place in the Guinness Book of fucking retards. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Oh, come on, that's not a Chinese guy. I wasn't saying it was. No. Some gold-plated chains would make a nice retirement gift for a very, <laughs> very one. good slave. <laughs> It would run for 39 episodes before Netflix bought the format and changed the name to Norm MacDonald Has a Show in 2018. At the end, we weren't getting along. <laughs> <laughs> but, I think Hitler had a for Chaplin and Hardy mustache. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. Oh, we're talking. <laughs> Male author is obsessed with female bodies. Going on and on about webbed feet and soft I I insulated. I'm sorry, that's male otters. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no! I see my clock on the wall. That's time to bid you one and all. Goodbye. Goodbye. So long. So long. Farewell. Farewell. Adieu. Adieu. Vegan. Stay well. Bye-bye. Keep warm. Relax. At ease. Take care. Stay loose. Adieu, mon vieux. A la prochaine. Goodbye until we meet again. Norm was invited back to perform stand-up on David Letterman's last ever show. I remember Dave differently because the first time I saw him, I was 13 years old. I was living in... Uh, <laughs> 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 I was living in Toronto, Canada, and I went to a talk show they had there. And uh, David Letterman was the stand-up comedian on the show. And uh, I loved stand-up. And David Letterman did this joke that I told everybody this joke. I love this joke. It still uh, stays with me. It was my favorite stand-up joke ever, so I'd like to do it for you if you'd like to hear it. <laughs> it's funny as well because like now there's it come out that he battled cancer for a lot of his life by the looks of this from this documentary. I didn't know it was so early, but obviously he was on and off with cancer having this kind of yeah, life kind of meaning of life thing. But people say well, the reason why goodbyes are sad and so sad is because it's the the fall of death. That eventually you say goodbye for good to everybody you know. <clears throat> but yeah, in one way or another. But yeah, let's go. He goes, um, I, uh, I, I was on the street the other day, and uh, I, uh, I saw a garbage truck, and on the back of the garbage truck, there was a small sign that said, please do not follow too closely. <laughs> Another of life's simple pleasures, ruined by a meddling bureaucracy, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> you remember the old days when... When Dad would pile the kids in the station wagon and we'd all go out and follow a garbage truck. <laughs> so anyways, I'd just like to say I know that uh, Mr. Letterman is uh, 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 not for the mockish and uh, he, has, uh, he has no truck for the sentimental, but if something is true, it is not sentimental and I say in truth, I love you. Oh, my God. God. Oh my God. Very funny, Norm. And thank you. Thank you for everything. Thank you. Norm McDonald, ladies and gentlemen. That was very sweet, Norm. Norm underwent chemotherapy for his cancer, after which it went into remission. But in early 2020, it returned, turning into Myler's Plastic Syndrome, a cancer that often develops into acute leukemia. When Norm got ill, his mother, being in her late 80s, would move into an apartment in the same complex as Norm so that she could look after him. Norm would regularly upload clips to Instagram of him and his mother being silly. Uh, uh, don't 
won't eat me. My friend and I were in a bush one day and a bear appeared. And I said I was gonna run away from the bear. She said, you can't run a, outrun a bear. And I said, I can outrun you. Why did God make only one yogi bear? Because when he tried to make a second one, he made a boo-boo. Hey, listen, <laughs> so uh, we're brought to you by Collagen Water. It's made to make you look younger. We're now going to test it out with my mother. Have a drink, mother. When COVID hit and lockdown started in 2020, Norm would post. It's nice to know that, like, Norm never lost that relationship because it is literally, even though they're both old, that in that it literally is a little boy and his mum, literally what you saw then. Videos on Instagram of interviews with friends in the industry called Quarantine. Many of Norm's friends now knew he was ill but didn't know how to approach the subject. What are you doing there? I'm going to phone my good friend, uh, Josh. <laughs> Hello. Oh, there you go. Hi, Josh. I saw the folks that you're from, uh, from Maine, and, uh, so I was, uh, just... How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing great. Couldn't feel better. Why? I feel great. Oh, right? I feel great. All right. Anyway. Um, so. Norm would also film his last comedy special titled Nothing Special from his living room as venues were shut down due to the pandemic. With his health deteriorating, Norm entered the City of Hope Medical Center in July 2021. This is where he would remain for the rest of his life. And I'm pretty sure, I'm not a doctor, but I'm pretty sure if the cancer dies, I mean, if you die, the cancer also dies at exactly the same time. So that, to me, is not a loss, that's a draw. That's a, you know what I mean? It's not like the cancer's gonna jump up and go, ah, I'm Uncle Bert's wife, where is he? I won fair and square. The only thing an old man can tell a young man is that it goes fast, real fast. If you're not careful, it's too late. Of course, the young man will never understand this truth. That was finished. Yeah, that was, um, Actually, surprisingly darker than I thought. Nala, play nicely if you're going to play. No, don't throw the ball around. Nala. But yeah, that was surprisingly darker than I thought it was going to be. Like, in moments. But then, it, obviously, you still had the kind of norm. But then Norm's humour is very dark. Like, not just, like, offensive. It's not just that. It's, like, well, like, the 9-11 thing. There's nothing really offensive about that, but it's just, yeah, it is dark. Um, so I suppose that's why he has that dark humour, because dark things happen, was happening to him in his life. I have to watch that last stand-up he did as well. I have to react to that. Because I want, yeah, I have to do that. I wonder if you can get it. You must be able to get it if he just filmed it in his front room. But, yeah. Good documentary, though. This was a good request from Xenophobic. And definitely keep requesting Norm if you made it this far. Um, but then I've got a Patreon now who's requested one Norm. So, so yeah. But, yeah, that's the reaction. Sweet.